All right, I'd like to introduce you to Casey Cauley. Casey's an instructor in the marketing department at Robinson College of Business, published four books in four years from Roy Hill, Barron's, and other publishers. Titles include Effective Letters for Every Occasion, 100 Plus Strategies for Office Politics, 100 Winning Answers for the Toughest Interview Questions you Need to Ask Her About Those, and 200 Ways to Turn Any Employee into a Star Performer. Popular speaker and coach for leadership candidates, she has directed management training for APC and over 100 trainers worldwide. Ms. Foley received her MA in English and Media from the University of West Georgia, and she holds a BSED in English Education from the University of Georgia. Casey Cole. That's a little bit about me. Let me find out something about you. How many of you, through an internship or through a uh, a part-time job or full-time job have worked in an office setting already. Raise your hand. So most of you do. And how many of you feel that you're busier right now than you've ever been? Yeah. Okay. And how many of you read every single one of your emails? <laughs> <laughs> you do? That is so amazing. Wow. Okay, that's what, you're, that's what the people you're going to be writing for, or that you do write for in business, are going to. They're busy like you are. They don't read all their emails. So what my presentation tonight is about business writing, and it will be very different from what your English teacher told you, because I am preparing you to write for very busy readers who have different goals, they want different things from you, and it's totally different from what the English department teaches. I coordinate the undergraduate program for business communication here at the Robinson College of Business. And we are a business course first. We are a writing course second and presentations course. But our focus is on how to thrive and how to make our graduates thrive in the job market. And once they get a job, how to thrive in the workplace. And again, some of the things they sound very contradictory from what an English an English teacher taught you to write for academics. Academics really like you to be very thorough. They like you to tell people what you're about to tell them, tell them what you have to tell them, and then tell them again at the end when you yeah. summarize. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people in business, particularly in email, do not have time for all that. So it's a totally different approach. Now, good grammar, still very, very important. You still have to have good grammar, mechanics, that type of thing. I have been a consultant for, I've had my own business in consulting for over 23 years, and many Fortune 100 companies, as well as many small companies, and startups, and uh, technology companies, that type of thing. And I'm quite often called in because someone has been an excellent employee, they're an excellent engineer, they're an excellent accountant, they're an excellent actuary but they have risen to a certain point in their careers and their boss really likes them, the boss wants to recommend them for the next job at the next level, they can't get the job. They say until we work out their language skills and we improve their writing, cannot promote this person to the next level because at a certain level, it's not just how well you do your job, it's how you package the information and send it out to other people. I got some very good advice when I started my career. Um, the first consulting firm that I worked for, my boss told me that when you go into any job or any business, it's like opening up your store. Each one of you would have your own little store. And you know, when you go shopping, like at the mall or if you're in a downtown area like this that has storefronts, the storefront is what makes people either want to buy you or buy from you or not. And so your writing today is very much part of your storefront. At one point, we used to have more meetings, more face-to-face. -face. We do a lot of that by email now and by written reports. So today, you have many people who are looking at your storefront and they're judging you based on your writing. They judge you in your cover letter. They judge you in your follow-up emails. They judge you in your thank you letters when you follow up for an interview. They judge you inside the company when you package or write anything. And so for professionalism, I really can't think of anything that says more about what you have to offer an organization and what you have to sell and how professional you are than your writing. That's one of the things. So for me to really help you understand 
today, that's why this says 2012. Today's business writing, for you to really understand what's important, I need to put you in the shoes of the reader, because you're all readers. You've been in the workplace, you know what I'm talking about. So let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to give you an imaginary situation. I want you to imagine that you have been at boot camp, then you go on vacation, you've been gone for two weeks, you've been out of the office for two weeks, and you come back to your busy job, and when you get back to that job, you have all this stuff to read. You have emails, you have snail mail, you have inner office memos, you have all the stuff to go through. What do you see yourself doing as a reader as you go through your mail? This is the part where you answer. <laughs> What's that? Email titles. You, okay, you look at the title or the subject. Okay. Okay. You look at the uh, the from, especially if it's somebody with authority. The date. What's that? The date. The date. Okay. The length. What? The length of the email. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now we got an honest woman over here. All right, what else? First line. Upload. Yeah, re read the first line. Probably skim through. Skim. Last line. And some people look at the bottom line, the last one. All right. So let's talk about this. This is the process that all of your readers are going through. So all of your writing for business needs to be designed around this because your readers are just like you. You have to spend a lot of extra time on the title or subject because that makes people want to read it or not read it and we'll cover that tonight. Your boss or your boss's boss can write as badly as they want to and you're going to read it anyway, right? But most of you right now in your career don't have this kind of authority that people will read and put up with you. So your writing has to be better than your boss. Because I have people all the time say, well, I don't need to really learn to write that well because my boss is a terrible writer. He's been very successful. <laughs> well, today, you really have to do a little bit better than, than uh, that at one time people had to. Now, the date, that's important. But also adding any kind of dates, like due dates, deadlines, it's interesting, even though you have no authority, if you say, I need this by August 23rd, you will get twice as many responses quickly than if you don't put a date on it. So always put a date on it. The length, this is something you have some control over. And even though you want to be thorough and you want to include everything that the reader needs to know, but you don't want to include one thing more than they need to know because if you get a reputation for writing a lot of long emails, people will start delaying or postponing your emails. Do you have people that you think, oh, I say I'm going to read this one later because I know this is going to be long and wordy. And so you kind of put them in the do later file. You know the do later file? And a lot of times we we'll never get back to that. You know, so that's what we do. We don't want to be in the do later file. So that's, this is critical. And you don't want to get that reputation. But again, I want to stress, I'm not giving you permission to be uh, to, to not give complete information. You need to learn to, to write in a way that you give all the information needed, but in a very efficient, short way. All right, first line, you're right. A lot of people have these uh, different methods of skimming. Some people read the first line in every paragraph. Some people read just the first couple lines of every email and the preview panel. So those are critical and we're going to talk about that. And then other people do the first and the last. People have all kinds of systems. This is another reason to make the length very short if you can. Because if you can do that, then people will look at that and say, well this is short, I'll just go ahead and read it. Either you're going to control what gets skipped or they're going to control it. And you want to be in control of that. You don't want to have uh, people skimming the most important way. Because everybody thinks they're really good at skimming, but they don't know what they've missed. They may have missed the most important thing. Now, let's take a look. Let me give you a handout. And a couple of things. Now, this will be a memo. We, we're going to concentrate on, on emails tonight, but 
We need a paper document. He'll take one. Pass it to your right. in your inbox. Now, which one, this, this is not an exciting topic, but which one would have a better chance with you to be read, comprehended, remembered? Okay, the second one. Now let's take a look at that second one. What, what is it about that second one that is better? Okay, one at a time, one at a time. I'm a slow writer. Okay, it's shorter. Mm -hmm. Yes. The points are there. Can you see it on the It has bullet points. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It has bullet points. Okay. All right. Um, I see stuff that's bolded. So the use of bold. Okay. We'll talk about all this. Space. There's white space. No, white space. Okay, what else? What else is different? There's a due date. What's that? There's a due date. There is a due date somewhere. The font is larger. The font is larger. And what else is different about the font? Oh, it's not. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought it was a different font. Okay. But it's larger. That's right. Okay. What else? You have some bolding text. You, you're bolding some of the text. In the yes. Text. This bold really catches your eye. All right. Anything else? It has such the subject is much more easier to uh, comprehend. The subject. The subject is easier to comprehend. <laughs> We have one more. What else about it? Okay, let's talk about some of the things you've come up with because this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. It's this simple sometimes to make a difference as far as if people are going to remember what what you read, what you wrote, if they're going to actually read it. Because the real challenge today is to get them to read it because that just like you your readers are not reading everything now it may seem like a subject that is really really important to you but to your busy reader it may be a number two or number three priority so they may move it to the bottom of the list so if you're waiting on someone to give you information or to give you an answer or to give you an approval for something so you can move on and do your job you need to pay attention to a few simple tricks that will get them to respond to you so let's look at what you came up with. Yes, people will read a short email, a short document, before they'll read a long one. The bullet points are very important. Now you, in your field, you have to be highly organized, right? So this drives actuaries and engineers crazy when I say this. But in writing today, the appearance of being organized is actually even more important than being organized because I want you to see how fast you made up your mind which one of these documents you liked or didn't like. <laughs> Did you see how fast you, you didn't have time to read both those documents. You instantly had a judgment about that. And that's, what re, that's the way readers go through their mail today. So 
they want the appearance of being organized. You have to show them something, and if it's a longer report, you have to do it on the first page. You have to give some kind of organizational format, some kind of visual formatting like a table or a list or a bullet point or something like that to say to the reader, it says to them, I took all this information and I organized it for you because reader, I know you're such a busy person. So I took time to do this for you. That's what a document like this is as opposed to the other one. So they like, now they really like, what they really like is just the really simple, those bullet points. But this was a more complicated subject. Some of the subjects that you deal with are more complicated. And so we had to go to the outline form, which is not my favorite form, but at least it has an organi organizational form. And the other thing it does is it gives an opportunity to put in more white space. White space is one of the priorities of readers today. They like everything L-I-T-E like. They like it to look easy. You know, they want, they don't want to look, first of all, some of your subjects that you're going to be writing about are going to be challenging. Not all of your readers are as technically proficient as you are. You will be writing sometimes for decision makers who don't understand the subject as well as you do. So you have to do everything you can to talk about complicated subjects, but to make it look easy to understand. That's going to be part of your job. So the white space lays it out in a way that it says, here's some little bite-sized pieces. You know, you read this paragraph, it's really short. You look at this bullet list, it's not too hard, and you get them all the way through it. Now, the use of bold is interesting here. It is the intelligent use of bold. The old school way of doing bold was anything that was important to you, like if you had a subject that you wanted to highlight, you would put your subject in bold, like you'd say, you know, I want this by uh, July 31st, you know, and so you put July 31st because that's your deadline. But what you do instead is you put things in bold that are about the reader. People love to read about themselves. <laughs> they want it to be all about them. I used to work with a guy named Paul. He was one of the best trainers I've ever seen in my life. But he would make everything all about him. It really didn't matter what you, what you talked about. He would make it about him. And I worked on this team w with 20 other trainers, and, and Paul was one of them. And most of the other people on the team did not like Paul because he would always get up and we, would, we were supposed to be talking about business, and he would get up and he'd start talking about himself. He'd say, I bought these pants last night and they're pleated and not everybody can wear pleated pants, but I work out every day so I can wear pleated pants. It's just all about him, you know. And, uh, and he, he got the people on the team really mad because each one of us had a different area of expertise. And one of these women was a time management expert. And she came in and spoke to the group and she said, um, oh, I got the daytimer contract. I got the daytimer contract. She was so excited. And he just looked at her and said, you know, I'm surprised I didn't get that because I am so organized. He immediately, as everybody else was congratulating her, he made it all about him. Now, my friend Sharon and I were on that team, and we were the only two who really liked Paul. Let me tell you why we liked him. Because we thought he was so honest. A lot of times when people are listening to something, in their minds, they make it about them. They think, how is it about me? Paul was honest enough to just say it out there, you know, I mean, he just, it, it made everybody mad, but you always knew exactly what he was thinking. There was no hidden agenda or anything. And whenever I write, I think about this for people, is that everybody's a little bit, I mean, I don't know about you if you've ever been on a team and somebody got acknowledged or they got a promotion and you're sitting there going, I could do that, I'm a little, I'm better than that person is. We think it, but we don't say it. So your readers, when they, when they look at your subject, and this is a boring subject, it's about parking. So when they look at it, they look at it and they say, how does this relate to my world? And one of the things I did here in the first line, I said, have you or your customers faced problems recently with parking? Because the hardest people in an organization to get to read anything are the marketing and sales people. And I can say that because I'm from the marketing department. We have short attention spans. And so because of that, I put in there, have you or your customers? Because 
typical sales and marketing person, they'll say, you know, I can just show up and the security guard or somebody will show me where to park. I'm not going to read this. But they don't want their customer to show up and have a problem. So even though they wouldn't do it for themselves, they might just swap the customer in the first line because most of the people who are going to read this, they were in some way related to customers. So that, that, this is a generic uh, memo. It went to 10,000 people. How do you make it customized? How do you make it all about them? You can't do it perfectly, but you can add one or two words that make the people want to read. And that's why in bold, I put the floors because people might look at this and say, this is a generic email. I'm not going to read it. And they go, whoa, wait a minute. I'm on one of these floors. Maybe I need to read this. This may be about me. So you tie whatever you can into their lives, into their interest, into their job, into a piece of equipment that they have. You tie it to a deadline they have. You tie it to one of their departmental goals that you know that they have. You find some way to tie it to their selfish interest. Okay, and there is a due date in here. Well, it talks about it goes into effect September 30th, 2004. And the subject, now you may not, you may not want to go as simple as I did. I'm, a, I'm here tonight as a consultant, and consultants are kind of fanatics. You know, I'm kind of a fanatic on this subject. So I may have taken this to a level that's even simpler than you want to go, but somewhere between where you are and what to do about parking, which is ultra simple, there may be a happy medium. You know, all I'm saying is take what you would normally say and then try to make it a little bit simpler. So anyway, that's what you came up with on these. Come on, too. It's <laughs> not good. Okay. Now let's take a look. <laughs> One of the things I'm not going to try to get you not to do, thank you. One of the things I'm going to try to not uh, not change are your technical words. For instance, in your business, what are some big words that you have to have? Even though they're big words, you can't, like even actuary is three actuary, four syllables. Wow, can't even count syllables. Four syllables. So, what are some other words that you can't live without in your job? What's that? Solvency? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's important. All right. What else? <laughs> Risk. Risk. Okay. That's one syllable. That's a good word. All right. Evaluation. Evaluation. These, these are words that you are allowed to keep. Nobody's going to mess with that. Okay. But I, I want you to understand that you're going to have to take your technical words and you're going to have to put them in the context of simpler words when you're explaining things to someone who maybe is not in your field. And let me give you an example of what not to do. Uh, one of my clients is Georgia Pacific. And uh, I've trained the lobbyists. I've trained the people who are um, environmental spokespersons and engineers and very technical people. And they're very interested in the environment. They're, they're very concerned about the environment. To the point that if you do anything that alters a location or um, the terrain around a plant or something, you have to get permission for it. So a man who was working in Florida wrote an email to the home office over here, right down the street, and uh, he got back asking permission to do something. And the person I was coaching wrote back and said something about, well, that's okay, but uh, you, I, I'm concerned about, I don't know that you can do this because I'm concerned about thermal oxidative degradation. <laughs> okay. And I was reading this thing, and I can't remember now, it either meant to burn or to rust. I can't remember what it was. It was either burn or rust. I think it might have been to burn something. And, and I said, 
I said to this man, I said, are you talking about burning something? And he said, yeah. I said, this is not to the EPA. This is to somebody who works for your company. So just tell him, you know, that you're concerned about the burning. You know, this is not a... So you have to look at your audience and say, if I'm writing to the EPA, I might need to say thermal oxidative degradation. But if I'm writing to a guy who just wants to burn some grass on the side of the bank because we can't get down there to kill the weeds, you can just say burn. And that's what you have to do. You have to look at your audience. Let's take a look in your handouts here. Um, see that the page numbers didn't make it on there. Let's skip the finger typing to the one that says, what old, what old saying is each one below? Number one, scintillate, scintillate, diminutive luminous mass. Does anybody know what that says? You are amazing. Have you seen this before? Someone told me a joke about that is a very good. Okay, you can't participate on this anymore because you know all the answers. All right. <laughs> Number two, members of an avian species of identical plumage congregate. Bees. I don't think everybody heard what the first one. Is. Oh, sorry. The first one is twinkle, twinkle, little star. You start with luminous mass, which is you know something shiny. And scintillate is twinkle, diminutive means little. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way she cracked the code. Uh, or somebody told her the answers, we're not really sure. <laughs> but, uh, okay, what's number two? Birds of the same thing. Yeah, birds of a feather something. Birds of a feather walk together. What about three? Dead men tell no tales. That's right. Okay. Huh? Dead men tell no tales. Oh. All right, what about this one? Number one. Mm -hmm. People in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. That's right. Yeah. Okay, good. Number two. <laughs> yes, a rolling stone gathers no moth. Okay, number three. What? <laughs> <laughs> Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, these are unnecessarily hard words. Now, I know you studied all these words for the SAT, and you paid a lot of money for that education, and you want to use these words, but I'm telling you, when you start encasing your technical information in words like this, people go, what? What did that person say? And also misunderstandings can arise. So what we want to do is we want to take all your technical words and keep them, but we want to put them in a context of easy to understand words. Do you want to know my least favorite word in the English language? Are you just dying to know what it is? Okay, good, I'll tell you. Utilize. Now, the words we're going to talk about next, just because I don't like them, doesn't mean you can't use them. You know, I'm not going to follow you around and trace your emails, but I'll tell you why I don't like utilize, is that almost all the time when you see utilize, you can use the word use, and it works just as well. Yeah. There's no reason to have those extra syllables. So it's an unnecessarily big word most of the time. So what I'm going to do, because I'm no fool, I know that I am your last speaker of the day. I know that you've been sitting here since 8 o'clock. So I'm going to have you work together in partners. I am not going to stand up here and lecture because you will go to sleep. <laughs> so what I want you to do is, I, well, first of all, let's do this together and then have you work with partners. Um, I, I've already told you the answer on utilize. You can say use instead. Sometimes people say, let's get together and interface. What do they mean? Talk. Meet, talk. See how simple those words are? Originate. Begin. Start. Come from. Finalize. Finish. End. Significantly. Yeah. Greatly. Illustrate. Show. Show. Think about how much more visual show is than illustrate. You get a picture of that in your mind, and that's what you really want people to do. You want people to get really clear in their minds, almost like it's a picture of what you're talking about. Originally, begin first, at first, you could say that instead. So let's skip on over, past utilize, and past this list. 
and pass the typing fingers again. And let's take a look. Actually. Oh, I see. They didn't staple these together. Come on. We you could help me pass these out, and if we could get a stapler in here, for some reason, they didn't staple the handouts together, so you're going to have to just look at this. I want you to work with a partner and just like I did utilize to use and um, the, the examples I gave up here I want you to work with one other person and I want you to come up with uh, a substitute and I want you to try to get a one syllable substitute you can go to two syllables if you want to but do your best to come up with a one syllable substitute for each of these words that we see here on page three okay just jot them down if you struggle over one skip it and go to the next
Okay, I see a couple of groups have finished. It's, it's okay if you don't finish. I just want you to get the feel of that. What did you come up with for minimize? Anybody? Shrink. Shrink is great. What a vivid word. Shrink. Shrink the budget. Shrink the cost. Right? Those are great words. All right? Any other ones? Reduce. What else? Lower. All of these are better than minimize. Now, minimize is not a bad word. There's, there's the time. There's a time when you want to use minimize. It's exactly the right word. The problem is these are words that are overused in business. They're what I call corporate ease. <coughs> so what you want to do so people really pay attention to what you're saying, and this works even better when you're speaking than when you're writing. So if you're doing a presentation, it's much better to use a word like shrink than the tired old word minimize because everybody's used to hearing that. So you don't want to speak corporate ease all the time. Sometimes you have to speak a little corporate ease, but you want to throw in a good word like shrink once in a while. All right, what did you come up with for in conjunction? Together. Together or just with, you know, either. Just with is good. What about incorporate? Yeah, what did you say? Add. Add is good. What Fuse. Fuse is so vivid. Listen to, this is good. Okay. All right, what else besides fuse? Include. Include. Blend. There are a lot of good words that you could use. Now, again, um, incorporate is the tired old corporate word that we see all the time. And you can use it. There, there's, there will be times you want to use it. But how about use fuse once in a while? People will perk up. They'll pay attention. It's a little bit better. All right, what about emphasized? Stress. Very good. What about, uh, did we have another besides stress? Focus. Focus. I like focus. That's very vivid. All right. That gave me a, what was the one I heard down here? Insist. What? Insist. Insist. Okay, yeah. That's right. Okay, facilitates. Supports. Supports. Eases. Enable. Enable, guides, expedite. You know, you have to really, on that one, it can mean a lot of different things. But guides or eases, I want you to hear how much friendlier that word sounds than facilitates. Because, you know, actuaries, you can, you can scare people. Okay, so once in a while, you want to use guides or eases, you know, get a little bit more positive word there. Okay, assortment. Mix. Mix. There, who said mix? Very good. All right. Um, What's the next word? I can't read it. Develop. develop. What's a good word for develop? Yeah. Grow, build, make. What about endeavor? Try. Try. Try or task, depending on if you're using it as a verb or a noun. Assistance. Help. 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 Aid. What's that? Aid. Can be aid. All right. So let's talk about the last two words on this list. And I want to give you an imaginary scenario. I want you to pretend that a year and one day ago, you bought a Whirlpool refrigerator. And one year and one day later, the ice maker quits working. And it had a one year warranty, right? <laughs> so you write a letter. This is hypothetical. We wouldn't do it this way today. But let's just pretend you write a letter to Whirlpool and you tell them the problem and say, you know, is there anything you can do for me? Is there a grace period? Can you start the warranty from when it was actually plugged in and installed? I mean, is there, can you work with me here a little bit? And you get a letter back from Whirlpool and it says either one of two things. It either says, I will endeavor to be of assistance to you in this manner, or I'm going to try to help you. <laughs> Which one has more credibility? Try to help you. I'm going to try to help you. There are times that the smaller words are better. There are times that the bigger words are better. But the mistake that a lot of young professionals make when they go out is they want to use all the big words they just learned in college. Mm -hmm. And they're hard to understand. So what you want there, I want you to know that there are times you need to slip into the I'm going to try to help you with this kind of language. And choose the language for your audience. Bill Clinton was the master of this. Bill, whatever you think about his politics, doesn't matter. Master communicator. Master communicator. And he wanted to get his first 100 days in office off to a great start. So 
he hired the five best speech writers in America. And he said, I want you to write my um, inaugural address. I want the five of you, but first, before you write a word, I want you to do research. And I want you to find out what the greatest political figures in American history have done, study their speeches. I want to do what they did. And the only thing they found in common with all those people is they used a high concentration of one syllable words. John F. Kennedy ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Martin Luther King Jr., now he had a whopping vocabulary. He had the best vocabulary ever. And he could write like the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> He's good, I mean, good. But if you look, when he really got people on their feet and motivated, he got really simple. I have a dream. I dream of a day when every child, look at all those one syllable words there, he knew when to slip into the friendlier, the, the, the shorter syllables and all that. He was a master at knowing when to do that. My favorite story about this though is about a Yale University student who was told he was the valedictorian. And he was kind of a, you know, smart aleck kind of guy and so he had a lot of time to get ready. And he wrote his entire valedictory address in one syllable words. But of course, he had time. He had time to work on it. And it was great. I mean, he, if you chose some of the words that we're talking about, like fuse, you know, and mix and all this, it was very good. And not one person in the audience caught on that it was all one syllable words because he chose great words. They were short words, but they were great. In fact, it got the, the uh, longest standing ovation that has ever been given to an address at Yale University. So again, mix it up a little bit. Use your highly technical words, pull in some of the friendly words, mix those together, and you're good to go. Okay, now the second secret here on the next page, page four, uh, and, I, and I have 10 tips for you here tonight. The first one is, don't automatically reach for the corporate ease. Go for the simple words sometimes. The second one is shorten your sentence length. Again, people have terrifically short attention spans today. There are a lot of theories about why that is. But if you put the same information in two short sentences, one little nugget of information in this short sentence and one little nugget in the second short sentence, People will retain it much longer than if you write one long sentence. In fact, they tend to minimize if you put two important facts in the same sentence, they tend to forget about one of them or to forget about it more quickly. So be sure that you uh, try to do that. Let's take a look uh, on page four uh, on, under two. Average sentence length should be about 10 words. Uh, and that's approximate. And that, you know, in your company or in your environment, it may be more than that. But the, for, and I would, th I would think probably most of the things that you write, it will be high, the average is going to be higher than 10. But it shouldn't be much higher. And one of the ways that you get down to that average is you do what we talked about earlier. You put some bullets in, you put some other things in there, that, that shorts up the overall length. So the easiest way to quickly shorten up your sentences is to go through and look for your coordinating conjunctions. Uh, those are sometimes called the fanboys. Whose English teacher taught you about fanboys? Okay, you, you use this acronym. Uh -huh. That's right. You use the coordinating conjunctions for and not nor. Uh -huh. But or and yet all right and whenever you see that it doesn't mean it's like spell check it's not automatically wrong but you look at it and you say is this a place I could perhaps split the sentence into and you just go through and you get the easy ones you don't have to split all your long sentences but if you can find a few that you can shorten up a little bit your reader is going to remember what you said and a lot of times information you give people they need to take back to their boss or their customers or someone else and explain it to them and you want them to remember what you said. So you, uh, this, this is the way you do it. So number one, where could I cut, split this sentence in half? You could, that's, that's one place. 
uh, or at the but, either one. There are different ways you could rewrite that sentence, but again, the easiest thing would be to look for one of the fanboys, which is but. Okay, number two, where could you cut that sentence? There are a lot of options. You could make three sentences out of number two. Right after handheld computers? Or? Yeah, that's one place you could cut it. You could split it in half. With the laptops? What's that? How about at the end? That's one of the fanboys. And there should also be a comma before that end. These are these are things that were submitted to me that are wrong. So um, normally, when you have two clauses like that, you normally put a comma before the end. Okay, now, one thing that will help you uh, to make sure that you are not getting people to tune it, that people are not tuning you out, is to use what on, on Microsoft Word, it's a tool, it's called the readability scale. Okay, so how many of you right now are, are using the readability scale to proofread? You should do this. You definitely should do this. This is a quick and easy way to improve your writing and, and let Microsoft Word do a lot of the work for you. On Microsoft Word, um, the default position for all your options, and I showed you a couple of ways to change it there on the bottom half of page four, it's set to grammar. Most of you probably will not have grammar problems. You have style problems. Most people have style problems. Almost everybody has some kind of style issue. So what you want to do is you want to go in, and this tells you how at some point, you can go back and change your default to, instead of checking just for grammar, there's a drop down box, and you, instead of clicking grammar, you, clack, you click grammar and style. And it will give you so much more helpful information to improve your writing that you just won't believe how helpful it is. The other thing is it's going to give you some statistics. And it's going to tell you, sometimes it's called a tolerance level. How much will people tolerate from you before they quit reading? They just tune you out. And so it gives you numbers there based on, they call it a grade level, but you don't really go by grade level because the people who have the shortest attention spans and who want things the shortest are CEOs. I mean, they, they really want it very bottom line. And so you can't go by a person's education level. What it means is you, a person should not be that challenged to, to read something from you. So that's the way you uh, get your readability statistics. And if you set it up to run automatically at the end of every document, which you can do, if you get it, if you get, you have to do spell check to do it. But you know, sometimes I don't care about the spelling because, like you, I work in industries that a lot of times there are all these words that Microsoft Word doesn't realize they're correct. And so I just I flip right through the spelling part and just get my statistics and get my information. I see what I need to do to my writing. So that's that's a start there. That's a good tool, and it does measure. It's a lot of it's based on are your sentences too long or using too many big words that are boring people. You know what are you doing? So that's that's a great tip right there. Um, okay, next page number four. This is page five. Uh, tip number four: You want to use active verbs instead of passive verbs. Now, what does that mean? Let's talk about that. Would you come in after the weekend to your office on Monday morning and say, the weekend was enjoyed by me. A video was rented by us. Popcorn was popped by my partner. Uh, that's not how we talk. And yet, when we start writing for business, especially young professionals, we start flipping our sentences around backwards, okay? Normally, we would just come in and say, I enjoyed my weekend. We rented a video. My partner popped some popcorn. They just, you know, they just talk like that. And so, what we do for some reason, we, I, I think sometimes people feel like, now that I'm a manager, now that I'm a professional, I need to start talking differently. I need to start writing differently. So you start flipping your sentences around backwards. That leads to, quite often, to grammatical problems. It's hard to match all the subjects and verbs up, all the pronouns up, because you're turning your sentences inside out. So try to lead with what we call the doer in the middle of the page here. Uh, 
the, the correct, I mean, the, the more correct and the more impressive way is to say the client read the proposal instead of the proposal was read by the client. It's better to be active and say the controller accepted the offer instead of the offer was accepted by the controller. And people will understand you better and they will follow directions better and all that. The other thing you want to make sure is, is that you have an active verb to begin with. At the top of the page are just a few of the many, many active verbs that are out there. Active verbs are things that you can, that someone actually has to do. They can, they can be in the middle of this room and they can do. Like they can initiate, they built, they upgraded, they achieved, they, they won, they sold, they raised. All of these are strong actions and we use strong active verbs people pay attention to you. They think you have good ideas. They are, uh, they're, they're energized by what you're saying. They're motivated to get up from behind their desk and do what you ask them to do. So that's what you want to do. Now these are also great verbs to use on your resume. So you want to tell people what you, in your last job, what you managed, what you improved, what you supported, what you completed, what you secured, what you surpassed. Always ask yourself, what did I do in my job that the last person didn't do? A lot of times you'll, somebody will compliment you and they'll say, oh, you know, the person who had this job before, they never did that. I appreciate that. You did that. Remember those little things. I call them Valentines. Remember the things that you people told you that you're doing that you didn't realize that the person before you never did. Tell people what you advanced, what you progressed, situations that you turned around, what, did you, what you reduced, what you boosted, what you lowered, what you cut, and what you offered. All of those are just the start of the many, many active verbs that you should use on your resume. So again, active language, this is huge. Uh, tell people what you're going to do for them with an active verb. Tell them what, if you're trying to talk them into adopting a process, tell them what that process will do. If you tell people in terms of active verbs, they'll say yes twice as fast. Then if you just describe it all the time with words like am, is, are, was, were, I mean, boring. I'll give you, I'll send you one of my books if you can stand in the middle of this room and am. You can't am. It's not an action. Nobody can do it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, these, this is one of the things that, that we want to do. Uh, people who make a lot of money with their writing, they rarely use passive verbs. They use active verbs all the time. They also use the active pattern. The active pattern is who's doing what to whom. You lead with the doer, then you have the action, and then you have whatever's receiving the action. So people who write commercials usually use active verbs. People who write songs use active verbs. Now, because I am 62 years old, and I, don't, I cannot keep up with the music of people your age, we're going to use my generation's music all right, for this. For, so on page six here, what is this song? Uh, this, is, this is the passive way of saying a song title. Number one, in the name of love, this should be stopped is awkward. What's the active, what is the active way of saying this? Stop. Stop. I knew you could do it. Okay, what's number, what's the active way of saying number two? I second that emotion. All right. What about number three? First time I saw your face. Yes. Four. <laughs> yes. Correct. Five. Shake your That's right. Six. I do Yes. Seven. I will. Yes. Eight. Nine. I heard it. I heard it to the great five. Correct. Ten. <laughs> okay. Number 11. I put that on there because that was a long story. Okay, number 11. Yeah, the way I love you. Okay. Yes, the way I love you. Number 12. That's when I stopped stop loving you. Yes. 13. Yes, number 14. All right, now let's take this over to the business application. And again, you want to set, you want to start with whoever's doing the action, then the verb, and then what's receiving the action. So 15 is passive. The brief will be read by the business partner before the meeting. How can you say that in an active way? 
What would you lead with on number 16? All uncertified, All uncertified personnel. It leads off that sentence. Okay. How, how would you say number 17 in the active voice? This is a trick question. There's no doer. Yes. You would say review and record for future reference. Sometimes we don't have a subject or we don't have an object. And so you look for your verb, always start with a verb, and then you see if you have a subject before, then it's active. If you have whatever's receiving the action afterward, it's active. Sometimes you just have one of those. Okay? What about 18? The standards committee submitted an amendment. Exactly. And that's what we do a lot, that word submission. We take a perfectly healthy verb like submitted and we turn it to an ILN word, which is not an active verb. And so you, if you see words like that, see if there's a possibility that you can turn it into an active verb. Now, one reason I got very, very interested in this is uh, I used to, when I worked for a big consulting firm, I used to travel all the time. I was on the road um, so much that, I mean, I would go months without being in Atlanta on a weekday. I came home every weekend, but I was never here on weekdays. I was flying different places all the time. In those days, I racked up a lot of miles on airplanes, and you start hearing these rumors that if you get to a certain number of miles, you're in the, this little club where you're probably going to be in a plane crash. People start telling you, oh, you know, you got so many miles, you know, your likelihood of being in a plane crash is really up there. So then I started getting all worried about plane crashes. And this was really, this was back in the, the early 80s, you know, when, I know you weren't born, but, um, <laughs> but back in the early 80s where we really didn't think about terrorists that much. You know, we really didn't think about that type of thing. So I started wondering, you know, I knew that sometimes that the airlines had bomb threats. I knew that. But how did they decide which ones were like, oh, that's just a prank call? And which one were they risking my life with? I wanted to know this, so I started doing research about it. The number one indicator is someone who calls up an airline and they're making these threats. The number one indicator, if they're really going to try to do it, is if they use active voice. They say who's going to do what to whom. Instead of saying, well, a bomb was planted, and you know, it's just like they're, if they're passive, they're, they're saying, I'm not really taking responsibility for it. Now, what, how does that apply to business? Well, in business, you want to be the kind of person that you're going to follow through on your word. Now, you're not a terrorist, but you want to you want people to know that when you say something, you're going to execute. You are going to follow through on your word. So that's uh, you know that's that's a, a strong indicator. Okay, let's look at page seven. This is a very passive way of saying something. Can you think of an active way of saying? Instead of saying double check, if you want somebody to do something for you, you have to ask them with an active verb, and it has to be something they have to do, not something you're going to do, not something you want, but you have to tell them what you want. You have to say, send me, approve this for me, give me, sign this. So how can you be more active in number one Instead of saying double checking your application for accuracy is a good idea, what could you say instead? Okay, but you're still not telling them what you want them to do. That was an active verb. Yes, please double check. Now add that because when you start telling people to do this, you need to add please to it. Please double check your application for accuracy. All right, because it's a good idea. Okay, number two, how could you make that active? Actually, you're kind of hinting at something you want them to do. Please respond. Yes, or please vote. That's what you're really hinting at. You know, a lot of times people say, well, a lot of people are doing this, everybody's doing this. Tell them what you want. Please vote for this water amendment. All right, number three. How can you make an active statement out of that? Yes, please give consideration or please read this attachment. You tell them directly what you want them to do. 
and there's kind of a, a rule in that that the more times you ask with an active verb and you tell them exactly what they're supposed to do sign in the blank check the box whatever you want them to do send me the approval the more times they'll actually move a lot of times people are just waiting for someone to tell them clearly exactly what to do and here's some more verbs it has some of the ones that we talked about it has even more verbs those final ones on the right uh, the, the second and third column are um, excellent for your profession sometimes people don't realize how much work you do to come up with the reports and the information that you come up with and you have to start doing a better job if you want to really advance your career, you're going to have to start doing a really good job of letting people know what you did for them. It's okay if you do it politely to let people know what you did. Say, I investigated this for you, I researched this for you, I looked into this for you, I assessed this for you, I pulled together the numbers for you, I asked on your behalf, I calculated, I analyzed, I computed, on and on telling people what you did because you wanted to give them good internal service. All right, so that's the fourth one. These are some great verbs here that you can use quite often in business too. Let, send, choose, join. We use these all the time. Um, these are some other ones. These are used in context. The verbs in yellow show these being used uh, in sentences. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and when you come back, I'll give you the other five tips, all right? Yeah. yeah. Right? But yeah. when you see, you know, 
like uh, she was, you know. It's, you know uh, if I'm cool. Right. But if you're saying like me, you say, uh, let it, but it's the same word, but it's spelled but differently. She me tonight, it's it's, it's C O R E N T. How do you tell? I <laughs> <laughs> hear it. Uh, it's the same thing. So you, you, you just go off of context. <laughs> you're so 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you so you so 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 you just look for the, the word that comes yeah, in. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they say it so fast that you miss the, the L or the ill. Like, uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Uh, I have a uh, Rosetta Stone. Ever heard of about it? Rosetta Stone. Ever heard about it? Yeah. It's just this language you program. You know, so you, it shows you pictures and you say what you see in French. Uh, yeah. yeah, because yeah, you have I L and you have I L S. Yeah, oh, I can't tell the difference because sometimes the computer will say it to me, and then I have to pick the picture that matches. And I'm like, all right, uh, it could be either one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was just wondering if that is. Okay. I mean, I like the language, though. You know, I do like it. It's, uh, it seems like it would be nice, but it's 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 different. Are you leaving Saturday night or Sunday? Sunday. 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 Thank you. 
Okay. All kinds of companies, universities, uh, different people come up with <coughs> their top 10 or top 12 most influential words. These are sometimes called spin. How can you take a subject and make it even more positive? Uh, here are and, and what you do with these words, and you can look up any kind of list you want. Different different uh, organizations have these different lists. But you ask yourself, whatever topic, let's say you're trying to get your boss to let you hire one more person in your department. So you put that in this blank A, and you, and you use one of these influential words, like what can hiring another person say for XYZ company? What can hiring another person guarantee that we can do better? Uh, what could hiring another person help us boost or increase? What could hiring another person make easier for my boss or everybody else? Number five, if hiring another person is really successful, it could raise what? Uh, what could hiring another person aid others in doing? And you go on and you just, you play with those influential words um, and you try to use those as much as possible. Okay, number 11. Most of us write email more than anything else and all the other forms put together. So let's talk about some things on page 11 that are important to do in email. You've already guessed one. The subject line is really the key to whether they're going to read it or not. So you try to find something that is about them, but it also has to have the topic in it, because the topic, if they need to search their email six months from now, the topic needs in the first line. But it should have something that is selfishly interesting to them. You also guess this, the short emails give the message power. Use W-I-I-F-M. W-I-I-F-M is what's in it for me. In, in the first line. You use list and format. Today almost anyone's email can handle list and bullets. There was a time that those things would slide all over the place. But today it's pretty uniform that you can use bullets. Now uh, and I'm going to show you some examples in just a minute. If there are action steps that people should take, put those in bold, put them in headings. Be sure you use those action words and ask for what you, for what you want. Now other tips are, if you have a short attachment, go ahead and paste it into the email. Because many people, if, if they see an attachment, they put it in the do later file. They say, oh, all the ones with attachments, I'm going to read at a separate time. And they don't get around to that. So it's very short. Go ahead and paste it into the email. Now if it's longer, get in the habit of dividing your email into two parts. When you, you probably run into this in your jobs before. A lot of times, you'll have more than one person that you're sharing information with. Your, bo your boss may just want the bottom line, just the main thing. But there may be someone very technical that you're writing to that wants a lot of detail. How do you write to two separate audiences and they want two entirely different things from you? Well, get in the habit of writing two-part e emails. For instance, uh, on message number one, Elena, Everyone, everything that people have to know is above the line. I write emails quite often, my longer emails, and I put a line right across the, the page. And people that you write to all the time, you can train them to know that the most important stuff is above the line. Because if they're not going to read everything, then they need to know that you're going to get to the most important part above the line. Now all the background information is below the line, so those people who want background, detail, other things about that, the history of the problem that came up, all that, they can read below the line. And that satisfies that. Another thing you can do on message number two here, you can put the highlights in a box. Just paste a little box up at the top. And I'll tell you why. And you can do this on reports too. If you have a long report that you're doing and you have a fact that you're afraid is going to get overlooked, put it in a box. People cannot resist reading anything in a box. If you put it in a box, people will read it. I have no idea why. But put a, put a box around it, they'll read it every time. So in this case, in the box, it has the email highlights, one, two, three. Those are the most important things. 
Now down below, there are some bullets, but look what I did. I, on my email, I did left to right bullets. And the reason I did this is I knew that my reader was using a, a smartphone, a Blackberry, an iPhone, something like that, and I knew they didn't want to scroll all day long. So I did left to right bullets, but I used bold, I used dashes, I set them apart so that they look like bullets. So those are just some of the graphic and visual things you can do that people will say, this is very professional, and you will stand out from the crowd. Now for a longer document, like a report, usually you are working with more than one person on that. Before you get started, it's very important that you plan it and that you organize. You sit down and you talk together about who is the primary decision maker, the primary reader, what are we, what are we going for here? Are there other people who are going to read this? What do we need to include for them? And there's more detail here if you want to look at this later. What are the goals? What am I really trying to accomplish with this document? A lot of times when people sit down to write a report, they just dump out all the information from their heads on the paper. That's not very strategic. So what you want to know is, what am I really trying to accomplish here? And then you back that up with whatever support and winning details there, that you have. Is there going to be some opposite? What's going to be their biggest objection? What's the reason they're going to say no? And then you address that some way in the document. And then you ask yourself, should this be an email? Should this be uh, a, a nice report in a nice folder? What would be the best way to deliver this to someone? The other thing on the longer reports is on page 14. Be sure that you organize. This is the complaint I get when companies call me to come in and teach writing to a staff. This is the most, well, being wordy is the number one thing. But the second thing is this, uh, oh, what a nice thing work we have. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, the other thing that they add, they say, oh, this is so disorganized. They're, they're all, you have to go back to English 101. This is one thing the English teachers really got right, is every paragraph has to have a topic sentence. Because that's the cue, it's like a billboard, it says that's what this paragraph's going to be about. Uh, for an overall report, you have another blanket statement, or what I call an umbrella statement, that says these are the three topics, or the four topics, or the five topics that I'm going to be covering in this report. So, as you see here, for the thesis statement on, on your handout, that's going to have to cover, it's going to be on the first page, it's going to cover everything in the report. And then every section <coughs> has a thesis statement if it's a long report. But within that, every single paragraph has to have a topic sentence. If you do that, people will, they'll, they'll think you're very organized. But if you leave that topic sentence out, they won't think that. Okay, I want you to look at 1 through 13. Just read through those and tell me what you think. had an accident. They were filling out insurance papers. They did not think they were being funny. And you will have a day in your career when you've worked maybe an hour too long and you're going to write something and let's hope it's not any worse than this because let me tell you I've seen worse than this show up in emails that go to the whole company. And so you have to be sure you proofread. The number one thing that I recommend that you do for proofreading <laughs> is get a proofreading partner because the truth is it's, we're too busy. In the old days we could say to people, write it, let it get cold for a couple of days, go back and proofread it. We don't work like that anymore. Today you have to proofread while you're under pressure. So you need to get someone, you say, look, I'll do your proofreading, you do mine because 
you don't have to have a degree in English to catch most of these mistakes. You just have to say, there is something wrong with this sentence. And so you should get someone who will proof, be your proofreading partner because they will pick it up. They may not know what to call it, but they're going to know it's wrong. Also, when you proofread yourself, you start with the last sentence on the bottom of the page, and you read the one, then you read the one before, and you read up the page. If you read from top to bottom, your mind will fill in words that are not there. It will. And so you have to read the sentences backwards so it doesn't flow. Because you know what you meant to put in there, but it's not there. Okay, number two. If you have a tendency to skip or leave out words, use a ruler. As you go up the page, put it under the line. Use grammar check, spell check, the things I told you about earlier. Use that. That will check a lot of the mistakes. And there are many options on that that will pick out it also, and again, you need to go to your help because I'm, I'm not here to teach this, but if you, uh, when it points out something you've done wrong, if you will let your mouse hover over that, a lot of times it will give you a mini lesson on that. If you don't understand why it's wrong, it will give you a mini lesson on that. Uh, when you check your grammar, start with your verb, make sure that the subject matches the verb, and, uh, and again, commit to a proofreading partner. All right, any questions on that? Okay, number nine, we're almost there. Always say thank you and always follow up. Every document is a commercial for your ability to perform with excellence. Saying thank you is one of the best career strategies I can possibly recommend to you. Thank people for everything. Everybody that helps you here and there. I cannot begin to tell you the times that uh, even though you know I've worked for many C-level executives, I will tell you that the people who've probably brought me the most business are the administrative assistants. You know, they tell other people in other departments, this is this is someone you should hire, this is someone they are very influential. So whoever does anything for you, you write to them, you you say thank thank you to them in any way that you can. The secret to a great thank you note is you thank the get, thank them for the gift or the action or the favor, whatever they did. Everybody does that. But then you say something about the giver. Oh, you were very wise to choose that. Or what great taste you showed when you chose this for me, you selected this for me. Or uh, that was really strategic of you to be prepared ahead of time. Say something about the person and their qualities that led them to be so thoughtful. And they love that. And a lot of people don't do that second part. They thank them. They thank them for the gift or the action. They don't describe the giver, and that's a, a great thing to do. And these are some examples in here of uh, thank yous, like um, just you know thanking people for all kinds of things. There are a couple of examples, and you can look at those later. And then number ten, make every document visually appealing. Just like we had bullets and we like the good memo versus the bad memo, you can do that with emails, you can do that with everything. And we've already talked about how to do that when we went over the, the letter. So I'm just going to show you a few examples here. Uh, meeting minutes. Instead of writing paragraphs, if somebody asks you to take the minutes in the department meeting, come up with a format like this, like the topic, who was the person talking, and come up with the bullets. Not only is this less writing for you, you don't have to make all the sentences, but this is on page 19. You do not have to make the sentences, you don't have to write great sentences. You can just do bullets. Mm -hmm. And look how much more professional this looks. Also, if somebody missed the meeting, wouldn't you rather read this than paragraph after paragraph of minutes? Mm -hmm. Same thing on the next page. Here's another format that you can use. The other thing I do, if, if I have to go to talk to someone in another department, and I am going to get information from them, I will put my topics over here in the left-hand column, like on page 20. And then I will use the right side, I will leave the right side blank, and I will take notes in that right side column. That way it keeps me on track, I follow my agenda a little bit better, and I give this to them too. And then also, I have all the comments about that topic, like media interventions. Everything in that box relates to media interventions when I write that up. Because I don't know about you, sometimes I get back to my office and I have all these notes and I go, I don't know what that actually relates to. You know, sometimes you have sentences and you can't figure it out. So 
that's a way to do it. Uh, again, this was 21, was about two pages, page 21. This was about two pages of sentences. Instead, I made a table out of it. I put the need that this county or this company had, and then I put what needed to be done, just in a bullet list to the right. Much easier for me than writing paragraphs. Much easier for the person to read. Remember on page 22 that you need to greet them appropriately. In a business letter, you say, Dear John or Dear Mary, and it is a colon. It is not a comma. It is not a semicolon. It is a colon. If it's a personal letter, you put Dear John, comma. But in a business letter, you use a colon. People say, well, what's the correct way for emails? Well, the English department, when email came out, the English department wanted to pretend like it didn't exist. They wanted to pretend like that the, that email was, you know, not quite up to the standards of a letter. So they just weren't going to deal with. It. So we've really never standardized exactly what is right. Here are some examples of some things that are good. One thing that people love is if you will, and uh, internationally sometimes in many countries almost think that you're impolite if you don't do this. You start it with. Good morning, comma, John, colon. Good afternoon, Mary. Um, good afternoon, comma, Mary, colon. And so you, that's the best possible way. But if you don't have time to do that, you can just use the person's name or describe if you're writing to the whole team, you can just say team. But, um, you know, again, it's not standardized yet. Number two, you use what's the point statement. What's the point statement is uh, a topic sentence that says what the point is to the reader. Number three, you support with facts, reasons, tables, and bullets. You include only the things the reader needs to know. Use plenty of please and thank you. And close with thank you and also what the next step is. If you want something to be done, put next step. I always put the heading on there, next step. So there's no doubt in anyone's mind. This isn't just an informational uh, email. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I have a grammar site if you are interested in improving your grammar. And uh, I will, on Fridays the next time I'll be in the office, but I will set this up for you if you want to use this for six weeks. You have to get rid of your grammar problems. I mean, if you, you want to advance, if you have grammar problems or spelling or whatever, you have to get rid of those if you're going to be a partner, if you're going to really advance, if you're going to write your own marketing materials, if you're a small firm. Um, and so I'm going to give you all the user ID. And again, this won't be activated till Friday. Actuary. That's easy to remember. And your password, everybody has the same one, is GState. For Georgia State. All right. So again, uh, the best way for adults to learn grammar is just the way children learn grammar: repetition. Mm -hmm. Grammar is learned if you notice you study the same grammar lessons in the third grade, the fourth grade, the fifth grade. It's learned by repetition. So if you have an area like subject verb agreement, pronoun problems, comma splices, something like that, this has different modules that will help help you focus. And when you take the diagnostic test, like uh, on the comma, uh, comma segment, if you if you look at that, it will. There's a diagnostic, and it will spit back to you immediately just the ones you need to study. That way, you don't have to study the whole thing. You study just the ones that you are missing. One of the most common mistakes in business writing is what we call faulty parallelism. Faulty parallelism is uh, if you're doing a bullet and you say, I like apples, oranges, and eating fruit. <laughs> okay. That is not parallel. It doesn't match with the other two. The same thing happens if you put it in a sentence. I like apples, oranges, and eating fruit. Wrong. So, to fix it, you could say, and other fruits, or something like that. 
But if you start off with an ing in your list, ing words, they all have to be ing. If you start off with words with the word to before them, to run, to jump, to play, they all have to be to constructions. They have to be parallel. And that's, uh, especially on longer documents, people lose track. So there's some uh, examples of that here on page 24. Now, another thing you have to be careful with is being negative. And sometimes you're not really being negative. When, when I see people get in trouble for this in the workplace, they're usually very conscientious people who were trying to explain something in a way and they are misunderstood. This is an email that is called the evil email. This person was trying to be helpful. This person was kind of a little bit frustrated with trying to explain something over and over again. And so he went back and he put what the other person said and then what their response was. But it came out as sounding like, I'm right, you're wrong, and you are an idiot. And it was a big, big deal. So if you are ever a little bit frustrated with someone before you press send, get one of your friends to read it and just give you their honest opinion. Okay, on page 26, even on simple emails, you don't have to wait till you have something important. Practice good writing all the time. This is a simple invitation. And so you have, this one has the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, what time it starts and the schedule in bullets. Simple things like that. Get in the habit of doing that all the time. Page 27 <clears throat> is an email in its original form. Now look on page 28. What stands out to you on page 28 that did not stand out on page 27? The bold, the subject, that you've got to respond by September 29th. That gets them moving. The bullets, and also the fact that they have options. The minute you do that, it says, hey, you've got a decision to make here. Give me an answer. You've got three options, all right? Now, here's one on page 29. Many of you are working in your communities. You're doing volunteer work. You work for nonprofits. If you're working with a large firm, they're going to encourage you to do that. So here's the original asking for money soliciting funds on page 29 and look at page 30 see this lets people know this is an accomplished basketball team at this church that I'm trying to raise money for this is a good place to put your money they deserve it it stands out more in the in the after look at page 31 summary of what a lot of people in, in a professional development program did and most people would just read about a line of that and say this is so boring and skip on but look at this on page 32 it's very clear here here's how we select these people leadership teamwork communication and here are the qualities we want them to demonstrate very much clearer in the after now as you have think about all these things we've talked about here tonight I want you to know that I understand you don't have time to do all of this what I would like you to do is I would like you to consider tonight out of the ten tips what what is maybe one or two what, what would be one or two that you think you could actually apply when you leave here anybody one thing that you hadn't really thought that much about doing that you think I'm gonna apply this energetic words. I saw another hand. Can I use more uh, active sentences? Yes. The active, strong, powerful language. Maybe you know, more visually attractive. Yes, visually. It doesn't take long and in the long run it's going to save you time. Yes. Bullets help a lot. Yes, bullets. Something that makes breaks up the page a little bit. And I'm sure others of you have other things too. But pick out one or two things. If you try to do all ten, you won't do all the. Pick out one or two things that you're going to do. And my final piece of advice is this. Consider this information. With managers, when you're sending information up the food chain, 
on a long document, they're going to read the executive summary. They're going to read that pretty much 100% of the time. They're going to read an intro about 60%. The middle part, only about 15% of that gets read. Isn't that discouraging? And then the conclusion, a lot of people in a long report, they'll skip to the end. And they'll read, like somebody over here said, I read the first sentence and the last sentence. A lot of people do that. Same thing with emails. People read the first and the last. That part in the middle gets skipped. So the important thing that I have to tell you tonight is you have to make the opening of anything you do killer. Put all of your energy into doing these things in the opening. A lot of times if you have an opening that looks very polished, very professional, they'll hang with you through the rest of the document. But you have to have the opening. And for that reason, I always go back and write my opening last. I, after I write the whole document, I go back and I think, how can I write an outstanding opening for this? Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Questions? Anything about writing in your career? Yes. Um, I'm kind of hesitant to bold the things when I'm sending to a, I guess, senior level mm -hmm. people. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, if you want to start off very safely, uh, bold your headings. Do more headings to break up the page and bold those. And uh, again, don't bold anything that's selfishly important to you. Okay. That's like you're pounding on the table. That's yeah. the rude kind of useful. But if, <clears throat> if there's a topic, let's say somebody put them in charge of um, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. Okay. And that's important to them. You put Sarbanes-Oxley compliance about halfway to two-thirds of the way down that thing, put it in bold, they will be engaged. Okay? What else? Oh, yes. For the, uh, on page seven, for ask clearly and energetically for what you want, for number three, I was trying to think, uh, I didn't uh, quite catch what you said. To the me. attachment to the email is just as important as the email itself. Giving it consideration is in the reader's best interest. I would say, uh, please consider the attachment to the, to this email because it is as important as the email itself. But you, what okay. you want them to do is you either start with please consider or please read. Uh, okay. Because that's what, whatever you say after that doesn't matter. So you, you start off with what you want them to do. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, my question is when you're writing an email, I always have a problem on how to start say good morning because you don't know what time the person will read. And sometimes you say hello, or should I say hi, sir, hi? You do it according to your time zone when you're, okay. when you're writing. And people understand. Can you say hi? You know, actually, I see hi in some of the business books, but understand there are some cultures that that's too informal. So just I would just make it a habit not to use that. But I, it's actually in, in uh, the business communication book that that we use at Georgia State that someone in California wrote, but that's California, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's just really uh, one of those things that you, uh, it's safer not to do that. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. <laughs> May I open it? Sure. A million dollars. <laughs> 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 oh, wow. Is this from your program? From the International Association of Black Actors, yes. Very good. Looking. Thank you. I will definitely. I just got a new big office. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right, quick housekeeping. Tomorrow, how many people have cars over by the door? What I want you to do tonight is everybody is going to pack as much as you can. And if you guys who have cars don't mind, could you put as many bags as can fit in those cars tomorrow morning before you walk over here? 
the rest of you whose bags cannot fit, when we leave here at what time do we leave tomorrow? Well, I forget what time. Walk with me to the hotel, or so everybody can't fit in my car. Some of you go, <laughs> go over. I'm going to get my car and drive over to the dorm to try and fit all the other bags in there. And then we'll all go to the hotel together. We have to do this as quickly as possible. Why? Because you have your mock interviews tomorrow. You're meeting with the Corporate Advisory Council tomorrow. I believe you have emails with a list of companies who are on the Corporate Advisory Council. Everybody's going to have three 30-minute interviews. So when we get over to the Corporate Advisory Council meeting tomorrow, because they're meeting I'm sorry, they're meeting all day. It's going to be this. Oh, don't worry. It's mock interviews. Don't worry. <laughs> Just relax. Read. <laughs> when we go over to the Corporate Advisory Council meeting tomorrow, you're going to be introduced to the Corporate Advisory Council. They'll be introduced to you. There'll probably be some little bit of talking, talking, talking. They're going to have a schedule. So they have our, so the boot camp committee has already assigned you to the meeting. Everybody's going to be interviewed because there's enough council members for each of you. Everybody's interviewed at the same time. You have 30 minutes. You're going to hear a bell. You're going to hear a bell. <laughs> 30 minutes. Hear a bell. All right. Um, it's mock interviews, but you, and they'll give you instructions, more detailed instructions tomorrow, but you are going to interview. It's going to be, you know, you're going to do it like today, pretend it's a real interview, right? And you're interviewing as if you're an entry-level position into their actuarial program. So I know you got lots of emails. I have not seen the emails you got from Kate. Please follow the instructions of whatever the emails are that you got from Kate. When she tells you to dress formal, you dress formal. When she tells you to dress business casual, you dress. If you follow my instructions, I might lead you astray. Because <laughs> for me, business casual is the way to go. But Please follow Kate's instructions because I have not seen those instructions. I do believe that you'll be okay in your business casual wear that you have because they know we're leaving from here and going over there. But please just look back at the email, do whatever Kate says you want to do, right? She's in charge. Okay. So that's tomorrow afternoon. Three, and then after the three 30 minute interviews, you're gonna come back. I think you, they're gonna interview you for like 25 minutes and then give you five minutes of feedback. And then you're all going to come back, and then you're going to give feedback on how you found boot camp, and they're going to give you their feedback on you. They're a, they're a great group of people. The Corporate Advisory Council are the members of corporate who have taken an interest in the IABA organization because they believe in a IABA's mission and vision. And part of our mission and vision is the growth of number of black actuaries in the actuarial profession. That's why we're investing in you, because you are our students who are going to grow up to be actuaries. So we pay a lot of time to our college students and our high school students. Because of the high school students, because still a lot of black students don't even know what an actuary is. They're still saying, a what? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, because they believe in us, they invest in us. And part of their investment is this boot camp. So they want to know what you got from it. Was it good? How much you enjoyed it? Did you not enjoy it? What didn't you like? What don't, you know, what should change? What should, you know, that kind of thing. Feel free. Great group of people. All right? I have, I have, um, and they'll be at the meeting for the whole weekend. So that's all I have to say to you tonight. Get a good night rest. Pack up as much as you can. <laughs> and, um, so I'd, I'd, I'd expect that the people who have cars, the people in your rooms are probably the ones who will put stuff in your car, <coughs> your roommates. If it can't fit, don't worry about it. We'll try to get to my car tomorrow. My car not all that big, but we'll try. All right? About those of us who, who will not be able to fit the bags into the other cars, are we supposed to bring them all to one place? Yeah, well, huh? Yeah, I mean, you're going to leave it in your room, right? And then we're going to go over at lunchtime and get it. Yeah. So those who are the people with cars again? Who are your, who are your roommates? You you take care of your roommates. Can their bags fit in your car? Who is the other car? Who are your roommates? Yeah. 
Can their bags fit in your car? And who's the third car? Oh, you don't stay on. So we only have two cars. Yeah. I can, I can be there in the morning, but it's going to be early. Now, can you be there behind me when I go at lunchtime? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I have to walk over to the. So you just meet me over there. Okay. I have to walk back to the hotel and get my car. Okay. And we'll just try and figure the best we can and then head over to the hotel. We don't want to take too much time. You're going to have a box lunch, so just grab a box lunch and let's go. So at 4, are we going to be done for the day? Or is there more after that as well? Thursday, you're done at 4. OK. Wow. <coughs> Get some sleep. <laughs> you probably will be checking. You probably will be just checking in at that time. I have no idea. But I don't know if we can check in between 12, 13, okay. whatever. But We'll probably be doing some housekeeping stuff for that, but no. don't get lost, please. <laughs> Question? No, uh, just do, like when we park, um, we put our stuff in the car. Do we have to drive here or like we no, no. have time to go back? Leave the car. Okay. Uh, all of us are going back at lunchtime. I'll just be a couple minutes behind. I need somebody to come in because I have no idea where the storm is. <laughs> are you sure? So when I go in for my car, somebody has to come and get me because <laughs> I will get lost. Um, you probably said, but uh, what time do you use again? Um, tomorrow. Oh, 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 we're starting 8 o'clock sharp, not 8.01, not 8.05. 8 o'clock sharp, we finish at noon. No, no, no. Okay. We finish at 11. That's better. Between 11 and 12, you grab your box lunch and we head to the dorms. And then, oh, that starts at 1.30, 1.30 to 4. So we have between 11 and 1.30 to get our stuff, get over to the hotel, hopefully check in, put on your stuff, and get ready for CSD. Uh, so the interview is going to be at the hotel. Are going to be what? They're going to be at the hotel? The CSC is going to be at the hotel. They'll be, they'll be there all day with I can get more than um, four people's suitcase. That's if my roommates don't, don't ride with me. <laughs> just, just work it out. Well, we're there between. We, we leave here at oh, 11. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody will be here at 1 Because we can all just see what we have to ride. Hopefully, you are there. Come on, who's waiting? I'm trying to go to breakfast. It's the same difference. Do not forget the computers tomorrow. Those so who have to return to Georgia State, please bring them to me. We're good? Yeah. 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 Then you guys, you have to uh, 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 stuff like lunch awesome in your bag and you leave it out in the heat. I, get it. Yeah. 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 I wish my kids at school were like you guys. Oh, wow. What did you do? Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're not. 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 Oh,